Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Ilya Ganellan. I'm a data engineer at Capital One with the Vault 8 team. My colleague Brennan York is, is hiding there in the audience. So he, he's here for moral support at the moment. Um, today I'm going to take you guys on a, on a journey with and, and to share the, the story that we lived personally into uh, kind of the journey of the externalities of data engineering. It's all those unforeseen, unexpected, and uh, annoying little things that happen along the way that get in our way and make our lives difficult. It's the things that we don't expect to happen, and they do. The three main things that kind of to keep with you uh, as you're listening is, and, and what we felt is, the first thing that we encountered time and time again is that what we thought was a simple, straightforward problem turned out to be anything but. The things that we thought would work and that would be straightforward to implement and that, you know, on paper everything looks wonderful turned out, nope, we don't get that either. But in the end, you do always find a way forward and what you wind up with in the end might just be better than what you had when you started. We started very simply. We had a partner team that we were working with. They had a NiFi cluster set up, ingesting data, spitting it out into S3. We were taking this data, pulling it into our Hadoop cluster remotely, and then working with it from there. There was a lot of data in this lake that these guys had created. We were primarily interested in two streams. The first stream was fairly small, 25 gigabytes a day of compressed data. The second stream was on the order of about 200 gigabytes of compressed data a day. So we're not talking giant amounts of data, but it's enough so you have to start worrying about you know, things like running out of space on your cluster or you know, doing some decent amount of computation within a reasonable amount of time. So just, just enough to give you pause. We weren't doing anything especially fancy. We'd take this data from Hadoop. We'd run it through a combination of Spark and Flink to do some parsing. We'd use Spark and Python to do some analytics and modeling, all backed by Postgres. Now, again, nothing you know, particularly exciting or interesting here. We wanted it to be simple. We rolled with Spark because we wanted to be able to do you know, that initial fast exploration and kind of uh, tweaking of our algorithms and the data engineering components, just figuring out what features matter to us, what works with this data, what doesn't work, so on and so forth. We wanted Flink in the mix partly as just a POC to see, you know, how has the product grown and evolved recently? Has it become uh, better from kind of its introduction uh, in the past? And also because we knew at some point we did want to transition over to the land of streaming, to do things in flight. We knew that there's value there, but reasoning about problems as kind of batch problems initially just makes it more straightforward. Flink from the beginning has had this value prop that, you know, transitioning from batch to streaming is straightforward because fundamentally we're based on top of a streaming architecture. We figured, great, let's, let's try that out. And so we had some data. Life was great and we started working with this data and we figured out, well, right from the get-go, there's something funny. We'd be trying to work with this data, we'd try to read it in and, and, and do something useful with it. In the first data set, the smaller one, everything was fine. The second data set, it would take forever to do even simple things. And we started digging into why, and we found, well, what's going on is that within the system that, that our partners had put together, files would roll over by size, uh, or by, by time rather than by size, meaning that if you had an hour of data, um, that would become one file, so on and so forth. Now, if you have a small, infrequent data stream, that doesn't mean very much, but if you have a larger data stream, you wind up with pretty substantial files. Now, within Hadoop, this shouldn't generally matter because the way the data is stored on Hadoop, it's broken up into small blocks. Those blocks can then be read in, in parallel by whatever system you have based in your uh, Hadoop cluster. But because they had been compressing this data into gzip, and gzip is not a splittable format, what this means is that in order to actually work with this data, everything had to be serially decompressed. Now, the impact of this is it basically takes forever to work with it. We figured, okay, well, this is obviously untenable. We don't want to take two hours to process a single day of data. Let's look at what our options are. And so we dug into it. We found there's, there's a bevy of compression formats available in Hadoop. Uh, in theory, Hadoop provides kind of the, the, inter the low-level interface to work with all these formats, so any tooling that goes on top of Hadoop can readily take advantage of that, and everything will be, will be great. We wanted a format that you know, would be splittable to address this, this initial concern that we ran into with GSIP. We wanted something that would be broadly compatible with the tool chain that we had selected and hopefully we, that we'd be using in the future. 
And we wanted something primarily optimized for fast decompression. So storage was a concern, but it wasn't a primary concern. What we really wanted to do was get something just enough so that we get some savings over storing raw data, but ultimately that we can run fast analytics on top of. So of this list, we, we settled on LZ4. We'd worked with it before. We knew it decompressed pretty quick. Another way of looking at this is just to plot out the compression ratios versus the compression speed for these various algorithms. And you'll see that all the way over on the right, you've got LZ4, then you've got Snappy here, and then uh, Zlib, which is the underlying algorithm for Gzip, used everywhere, is all the way on the left. So you get high compression ratios with Gzip, but you don't get good performance. And, and LZ4 and Snappy, they're kind of all the way over on the other side. So high performance, less compression. And for us, this is fine. Now, one cautionary note to keep in mind here, compression is always going to be heavily dependent on the data that you're compressing, right? Your, basically, your mileage may vary. So that's why there's this you know, wide suite of algorithms out there, because it turns out that depending on what you're trying to do and the kind of data you're working with, some of these will do things better than others. Now, so we figured, all right, great. We, we found LZ4. Uh, let's, go, let's go talk to our friends over on the other team and say, hey, guys, try this out. We think this will make your life better. So right now, you're producing all this great data, but nobody can take your data and do anything with it in a reasonable amount of time. Why don't you try decompressing? Uh, why don't you try doing uh, all this in LZ4 instead? You'll get this great speed up. Um, we did some testing on our own. We saw something like a 60x increase in performance. So we were doing decompression um, and then analysis and transformation in minutes instead of hours. We were super happy. And we, we recognized that you know, NiFi out of the box didn't have support for LZ4. So we even said, OK, you know what? The way to do this is you can just use this command line tool that LZ4 provides. LZ4 is a open source project. You can go to the GitHub, pull down the tool, pull that into NiFi. Everything will be great. So we did that, um, and things promptly failed to work. Uh, what happened was that these guys totally excited about everything we'd come to them with, went ahead and, and made this change. Uh, you know, a day later, we, we started working with this data. And then half a day after that, there was a flurry of nasty grams that this team got hit with, because it turns out that there had been a production team that had been depending on them for this data. And somewhere along the line, that message got lost. So we uh, basically had this impactful change that happened. The production team could now no longer use this data because it was a, an external product that didn't have the capacity to work with LZ4. So they made pretty much a hard pivot from using our partner team to building a complete solution on their own. So our partner team was understandably unhappy about this. And at the very least, you think that given all of this, at the, we have good data now, right? No. So what we quickly discovered was that when we actually try to read in this data, all we get in is empty files. And this would happen with Spark, this would happen with Flink. And uh, when we even tried to read in from the command line on Hadoop this LZ4 data, we discovered, nope, that doesn't work either. In fact, you just get stack overflow errors from the Hadoop command line. And so we started looking, trying to figure out, OK, what, what exactly, what the heck's going on? Um, we found this Hadoop issue uh, eventually after some digging. And it turns out that there's LZ4 and there's LZ4. Um, namely, that what Hadoop had done is they had implemented a older version of the LZ4 spec um, using something called frame compression versus a streaming compression implementation, which pretty much the rest of the world and the LZ4 command line tool and everything else are using now. And the practical import of this is that Hadoop cannot actually read LZ4 data compressed via the LZ4 command line interface. Now, we figured, OK, this is why we're built on top of open source, because we can go in and we can fix this. That's the whole point of this adventure. So we said, OK, wonderful. We're going to patch Hadoop. And we went to look at this, and we started digging into what it would take to actually patch Hadoop. And we found, well, OK, first and foremost, all the other algorithms that do compression in Hadoop have implemented Hadoop's streaming interface for doing the compression. Somewhere along the line, someone forgot to do that for LZ4. So in order to make the community happy when we submitted this patch, we would need to do the same thing for a streaming version of the LZ4 codec. Now, by itself, that's not a super you know, intimidating proposal. The LZ4 codec has support for a streaming interface. It would have basically just meant adding it to Hadoop. 
The much bigger problem is that this would have actually broken backwards compatibility for the project, meaning that if we add this new LZ4 compressor that's able to do the streaming compression, we would now have two separate valid LZ4 formats in Hadoop, and there's basically no way to rectify that for everything that's using LZ4 in the past. You pretty much would need to add an entirely new format that's now a uh, non-Hadoop LZ4, and to do everything properly, we'd also realistically want to update the LZ4 libraries in Hadoop, which haven't been touched in ages. Now, the practical import again of this is that this is a big substantive patch. And for those of you that have had the pleasure of working in the open source realm, merging large patches is difficult. Uh, there's a very good reason for this. You don't want to just merge in code willy-nilly. Your, your code will degrade in quality. You won't have a good review process. And ultimately, your project is unlikely to succeed in the long term. But it also means that this went from something that should have been an easy fix into something that's far from it. So we figured, OK, let's, let's be clever about this. Let's rethink what we're doing. Um, let's look at patching NiFi. So what we figured we can do is, OK, we've already got these Hadoop classes in place. Hadoop knows how to decompress LZ4 and how to compress LZ4. Let's use those within NiFi. Uh, in NiFi, basically, we could just add a new processor, which is the uh, equivalent in the apex land of an operator, just a, a self-contained class that does something. This would be a strictly additive thing to NiFi, meaning that there's no re-architecting the code base. Should be a minor, not super impactful change. Get a quick review, get it merged. We'll have helped the community. Everyone will be happy. Uh, oh, there, turns out that there's not actually a Java implementation of LZ4 in Hadoop. What they've done is they actually pulled in the C libraries with which the LZ4 codec is written. At build time for Hadoop, they compile these libraries. They link them, and then when you run Hadoop, you've got these libraries that are on the class path, and they get dynamically loaded. Why this matters is that if we want this whole thing to work within NiFi, then we would basically have to do the same thing there, or we would have to ensure that these libraries are available on the class path when running NiFi. So the latter is hard to guarantee. And to do the former, we basically have to fundamentally change the build process for NiFi because this capability isn't there. So again, what went from a small change turned into a big change. We figured, OK, this is ridiculous. We're not doing that either. So step three, we figured, all right, there, there's no way we, we looked at everything that's out there. There's got to be some other options on the table. And so we went and we looked and we said, OK, you know, there, there's a bunch of open source projects on Hadoop. Let's take a peek into those, see if there's anything there. Uh, and we found one. Well, as I've already mentioned, the LC4 format that Hadoop is using is not documented or, or supported anymore. None of the things that we actually went and tried out, like when we ran some data through them, could actually produce something that Hadoop would read. And the, to do this ourselves, we basically need to, OK, go back to the drawing board, reverse engineer what Hadoop is doing, add the Java libraries that do the Hadoop flavor of LZ4 compression, and then pull those into our framework of choice. So again, we figured, you know what, this is hard. This is going to take too long. Option four. <laughs> brute force this thing, right? Do, do the simple thing. We'll just pull the data down locally. We'll transform it into a format that we can use. We'll push that back to Hadoop. Now, this will work. The downside of this is this is slow. Again, remember, several hours per day of data. We're talking about you know eight months or more of data and more is coming in all the time. And even if we, if we build this thing, and we implement it, then for any other new data that comes in from our partner team until they're willing to take the heat, so to speak, for making another change, we have to run this through uh, our process. So this, this adds complexity to the process, um, and it takes time. So again, this is suboptimal, but we figured, all right, we have no other choice. We'll at the very least do this. Plan B, we're going to be we're going to get our own. So we're going to get our own data pipeline. We'll, we'll leave out these other guys that are doing a whole bunch of other stuff that we don't care about. And well, uh, this can't be that hard of a problem, right? At the end of the day, there's a provider somewhere that's literally just sending a TCP stream to an endpoint somewhere. And the few things we actually want from this data stream, we just want it to be durable. We want to compress data on HDFS, and we want files to roll over to avoid what we were talking about before. Now, this is all a, sounds like a really simple thing. And it turns out, lo and behold, there is something that literally addresses this problem Exactly. It's been around since the dawn of Hadoop for like 10 years, and it usually works great. Um, easy to configure, easy to deploy, OK? 
Come on. There we go. So we rolled out Flume. We, we put in you know, some simple configurations, flipped on the switch, uh, started receiving data from the, the producer of this data, and we're super happy. We look at our first data stream, the small one, we see it rolling in, everything's working great. We look at the second problem child data stream and learn, okay, well, that one's also looking great. Our data rates are roughly matching what we expect to see. Um, we don't see any errors on our end, and so we leave this thing running for a day, two days, two and a half days, and then we get a nastygram from the people sending us this data saying, hey guys, we're getting constant TCP resets from you. We're also filling up our queue on our end, and this is breaking our system. So we promptly said, what the heck? We started digging into, okay, well, what exactly is going on with Flume? Um, and so we started flipping on debug options. We started digging into logs. We started messing around with the configurations. And configurations for Flume are you know, straightforward and they're fairly well documented, but there's still a lot of knobs to tweak. So we started tweaking all those knobs and we couldn't figure out anything. Like basically as far as we can tell, the system doing exactly what it should be doing. Everything seems to be behaving well, but we're actually horribly breaking things. So we don't wanna be doing that. We figured, okay, well, we, we need to reconsider this. So we said, okay, all right, Flume isn't working because we can't actually see inside Flume and understand what it's doing. We've worked with Apex before. We know Apex. We know, A, we can spin something up quickly on Apex and try it out. B, we can do local debugging with Apex. That's really valuable. C, we can actually see what's going on internal to the system when we actually run this thing because we've got a nice UI on top of it. Like, simply put, we had too many unknowns with Flume. We didn't know if this was a software issue, if this was a Flume issue, if this was a network issue, if this was a cluster issue. Too many unknowns. On top of this, we didn't know if this was simply a volume issue. Maybe Flume wasn't keeping up. In Flume, the only way that you get scaling and uh, partitioning of your data is you manually add additional syncs and, and output ports. And this is tedious, right? And again, as far as we could tell, everything was working fine. And to, to try doing that, like to scale it out by several orders of magnitude, would have involved a lot of kind of manual tuning. So Apex has all this. We didn't jump straight to Apex. We also thought, okay, what other kind of lightweight things are out there? We looked at Akka because, you know, Akka literally fits the bill as far as being simple, modular, easy to deploy, et cetera, et cetera, but doesn't have any support for Hadoop. So that was also a no-go. So... We said, great, we'll use Apex. Now, if you think back all the way to the beginning where I'm talking about everything else that we're doing in our pipeline, we figured, wait a second. If we're now deploying a generalized stream processor into the mix in front of everything else, we're still getting this huge volume of data in. We're not using all of it. Why don't we just start doing everything in Apex while we're at it? We're already updating our batch system in parallel to this whole work to do uh, systematic recompute on data. Basically, we don't want to reprocess um, many months of data multiple times, right? We realistically should only ever process them once, store the results and move on from there. So we, we'd already started that process. But we can also just do all of this in stream. And the practical import of this is that now we'll have a single system that'll do the ingest and the parsing. We can reduce the data load on the cluster and we can also respond to events in real time. Like this was a win-win near as we could tell. So we, we, we went about building this and everything was great. Uh, of course, there'd be no talk if, if that was the case. So uh, we still saw these TCP resets is, is the simple point here. And on top of this, when we actually went to try to figure out the compression bits with Apex, we learned, well, okay, out of the box, Apex only has support for gzip and bzip. If you remember, zlib is all the way over on the left side of, of the fence, meaning that, okay, well, we're still not getting the compression format that we want. And we also saw this, uh, what seems like a bug, which is the Compressed file rollover wasn't respecting the, uh, the size limit. So I'd say rollover every 40 megabytes and I'd wind up with a 100 gigabyte file. So that, that's not very helpful. So we thought multiple times now that the TCP reset had been a software issue. We thought that we were just doing something wrong, Flume was breaking. The reality of it is, well, no, it actually wasn't. So what changed now was because we're able to decompose what we're doing with the system, we're able to unit test all our individual bits for Apex, prove that those are working. We're able to put those bits together into a larger system, look at that thing running and prove, okay, that's also working. 
And we, this pushed us now back to the drawing board as far as tracking down the fundamental issue. We started testing out our cluster, testing out our network, and that's where we identified, you know what, hey, there's something wrong here. We're, our hardware is not doing what we think it should be doing. The, the import here isn't that you know, Apex did something magical by itself, but that the fact that we were able to spin it up quickly and understand the system and what it was doing provided us with that additional data to make the insight that, okay, there's something else at play here. As far as resolving the compressed data issue, uh, if you remember all the way back in the beginning, I talked about Snappy. Uh, we figured, okay, well, LZ4, we still don't have a way to easily work with that in Hadoop. We do, however, have a streaming codec for Snappy. And Snappy still pretty fast decompression speeds. Let's roll with that. And this time we were careful. We didn't just jump straight into that. We saw that, again, Hadoop actually has its own version of Snappy. It's not the same Snappy. But now we're residing safely within the Hadoop ecosystem, so this is fine. So we, we dived into the Apex code. We looked at, OK, exactly how does Apex implement decompression? And compression turns out it's pretty straightforward. We, we replicated that little bit of code, um, something like 50 lines, tested it out. Lo and behold, we can output Snappy uh, with, with Apex, we're super happy. On top of this, we demonstrated that we can readily, you know, tweak the partitioning and so forth to get multiple uh, outputs out from, from a single data stream. We figured, great, we've shown auto scaling and load balancing. This is fantastic. And we're, we're working still on isolating the, the rollover issue um, at the moment. So the, the kind of overarching lessons for all this, and, and some of these will, will be blindingly obvious, and to those of you that are are wiser and more sage than, than I am, please come talk to me later and, and teach me more so I don't make these mistakes in the future. But uh, for, for the rest of us, um, first and foremost, don't change your system without talking to your customers. And the, the second bit of that is that really test end to end. For, for everything that we do, I think we always get focused in on the pieces that were you know, immediately in front of us, and we forget that, hey, there's upstream components, there's downstream components, and if you only look at the middle, something's going to get dropped. So test your system end to end before you make these big substantive changes. The next bit is that you can't always do this, but if you can, own your own pipelines, because then things are within your control, and working with technology can be easier than working with teams or people, <laughs> which is, is a sad thing to say, but Technology is predictable, and it doesn't have you know, its, its own requirements or its own things that it cares about. So uh, have a backup plan. If in all of this process we hadn't always had you know, the plan B, the next option, the next thing to try, we would have been sitting there spinning our wheels, trying to track down the root cause of what was going on, instead of be able, being able to move forward in parallel on another track. And the last bit, and I think why a lot of us here, are one, use extensible and debuggable tools. So open source and something that gives you visibility into what it's doing. That's absolutely critical when you're trying to actually get things to work. For the second bit, just some broader reflections on the open source community. And Amol talked about this in, in his keynote at the beginning, that open source can be a curse as well as a blessing. And uh, I know that I feel this acutely, but Concretely, why? First of all, just because the code is there, it doesn't mean it's doing what you want. At the end of the day, every project that's out there was built for a particular use case that's not your use case. The hardest thing to do is to make generalizable tools that support a broad variety of use cases and situations. Um, on top of that, once you're at that starting point and you actually want to modify this open source code that you have in front of you and you know you can touch and play with, modification is easy. Modifying it and giving back that's the hard part. And when, when building a new community, uh, I, I know that everyone here is, is aware of that. Um, not everything plays nicely together. Even the popular tools, the things that you see all over the place, and that have the support that you expect on paper, those aren't, uh, just because it says it does a thing does not mean that it actually does a thing. So bringing us back to the earlier point, test your assumptions, test your system end to end. Verify that things actually do what they say they do. And the last bit, and, and my final parting thought, is that I think we still lack pluggable solutions for data engineering problems. Um, and, and again, this is, this is tying us back to the keynotes, that there isn't something out there that has solved this problem. Um, but I think Apex is a good step in the right direction. So 
if you want to learn more about streaming, I invite you to take a look at some of these links. There, there's some pretty fun information in there. And there's a whole bunch, um, or compression, sorry, not streaming. Um, and there's a whole bunch more uh, information out there. It's a pretty fun read, but I couldn't include all of it. And thank you all for being here and, and for listening. Questions? We got Myland over there. Curious about why a 10 megabit per second network causes problems? Can, can you speak up? I can't, I can't hear you. Uh, why does the network speed matter? Uh, it, it wasn't a network speed. So what we were actually seeing and, and this is in, in trying to isolate kind of the root cause of the issue. This, the simple, what we were seeing was we could send a small volume of data, everything would be fine. We'd send a slightly larger volume of data, and we'd start seeing TCP resets. We send an even larger volume of data, and things would start just pretty much catastrophically breaking, and like we'd stop getting data received on the other side. And when I'm talking slightly larger volumes of data, I'm not talking very much at all, right? If we have a 10 gigabit Ether connection, uh, Ethernet connection, we should be able to easily pump, you know, hundreds of megabytes per second um, through this thing. And the reality was that if we go past the point of like 50 megabytes, uh, megabits per second, things would start to break. And the this is still kind of an ongoing thing that we're trying to isolate and resolve. We're also in parallel trying it out in a different environment um, on AWS, where we're not dealing with on-prem hardware that we don't know what's going on with, to see if the same thing happens there, and we're just doing something silly along the way. But um, yeah, the short of it is basically like, we're trying to pump data through what should be a giant pipe, and we're not able to pipe, pump very much data through it, so. Mm -hmm.